I knew I would forget if I waited till the end. So, you know. <laughs> it's been quite a week, hasn't it? I spent last week in Charleston, South Carolina with a couple of very good friends. And um, I don't mean to rub that into you, but I didn't mind missing the snow at all. So even though it was kind of a gray and dreary week there, it was so much better than what was going on here. And so I'm thankful that we were able to get home safely yesterday, a day later than we planned, to make sure the roads were clear. Um, But anyway, it was a great week, and I'm so glad to be back home again. This was the first time I had ever been to Charleston. And I really enjoyed getting to know this vibrant town that was so different from anywhere else I had been. Charleston is a busy seaport city. It's not especially large, but in some areas the population is kind of dense. And what struck me about Charleston is how diverse the people there are. There were all kinds of people that we encountered on our trip. So many different types of people called Charleston home. In the medical center that we visited there were nationally known doctors and the professionals that support them. And then there were the patients. And this one thin elderly gentleman greeted me with what I assumed was a big smile from behind his mask as he spun his wheelchair around in quick circles and revealed that he had no legs reaching out the end of his chair which so often happens to those who are impoverished who have diabetes. A lot of times they end up with both of their legs amputated. And so he was um, one of the unique people that I met there. In another area of town, we, uh, we dined with hipsters who were enjoying their um, keto-friendly menu for lunch and wearing all of the right skinny jeans and scarves and graphic tees that go along with being so hip like that. Yep. Then closer to the beach, there were more well-to-do residents and visitors alike who strolled along in their name-brand clothing and expensive tennis shoes with their golden doodles in tow as they walked along the sidewalks and the beach. And then there was the historic district where brick and stone buildings rose from the cobblestone streets up into the sky. Steeples of churches dotted the skyline. There's over 200 churches in Charleston, a city that was founded for religious freedom. We toured the area and got to see the homes where people lived, and we visited the marketplace downtown where all kinds of people brought their goods to be sold and traded. And this area of Charleston is also home to a lot of students and academians who attend Charleston College there, a liberal arts college, one of the first in the country. It was founded in 1770. And then we also visited the port where the USS Yorktown is moored. That is an aircraft carrier, and so it was this huge ship with all kinds of planes on it, and, and it was pretty cool as we got to explore the ship on our own and climb up the, the stairs and see the different areas of the ship, almost like a time capsule frozen in time from the late 50s. And while we were there, we got to speak with one gentleman who was a Navy veteran, and he showed us a picture of himself serving on that very ship, and that was kind of cool. He was very proud of his service and what the military had done there. And from there, you could see all these other boats that were docked nearby. And then you could look beyond those boats and see an ocean that went on for miles and miles with nothing but waves that met the horizon. Charleston's a pretty cool place. And all kinds of people there. Endless stories that intersect with one another. And in some ways, this town reminded me a lot of the town of Corinth. Corinth was a city in in Greece that was also a seaport. It was famous in the ancient world. The city had been there for hundreds of years, and people traveled from all over 
to meet there and to do trade. It was a connector between the Aegean Sea and the Adriatic Sea. And so you would see people coming from one side of the world and trading with people from the other side of the world right there in the seaport city of Corinth. It was bustling commerce there and travelers and tourists and and certainly it was a culturally diverse group of people. So there in Corinth, you had people who had moved there from all over that part of the world, from all different backgrounds. Corinth was generally known to be a prosperous town. It was um, materially wealthy because of its commerce. It was a great place to live and vacation. Instead of church buildings dotting the skyline, though there were temples and shrines and monuments to all kinds of gods, mostly mythological ones. And so you'd see this was a very spiritual town, and people would go to the shrines to worship whatever god they happened to need that day. Athena, Apollo, Poseidon, Hermes, Isis, and more. And the most prominent god there in the area was Aphrodite, whose temple was served by over a thousand prostitutes, greeting the residents and visitors alike. So many of the people in Corinth practiced this worldly, misguided religion, dedicating themselves to false gods and living lives that had nothing to do with the one true God. And in that way, the town of Corinth was a little bit more like seaport cities we might imagine in Los Angeles or San Francisco. Other places where people worship different things. The people of Corinth were known for drinking, they were known for partying, and they were known for loose sexual morality. And generally, to be a Corinthian was to be considered drunk and sexually out of control. And so in literature, you'll find references to people from Corinth, and that's generally what they meant. Somebody who spent most of their day being drunk and doing things they shouldn't do. It was said of Corinth that it was intellectually alert, materially prosperous, and morally corrupt. This was the town of Corinth. And in the midst of this seaport city then, was this small, young, budding church, this group of Christians who had been transformed by the power of Jesus and who met together to do and be God's people, right? And so imagine what it must have been like in the midst of all of this busyness and corruption and immorality that was going around to be this little band of believers who were sticking together and trying their best to be the church that God had called them to be. These were Gentiles. And most of them had come out of that very culture that they were now separate from, right? They had been the ones worshiping other gods. They had been the ones visiting the temple prostitutes or even the temple prostitutes themselves. This group of people didn't grow up with the privilege of knowing Yahweh and learning the ways of Israel. They were children of the world. and They had grown up among this corruption, but something happened. And so they became followers of Jesus. This is the group to whom Paul wrote his letter that we call 1 Corinthians. And as we study this letter together through the next few weeks and months to come, we will see that the church at Corinth did not get everything right. Is that understandable? It's probably an understatement to say that they didn't get everything right. And yet they were still there. And they were still struggling to become the church they were called to be. And God had called them there together. So Paul's letter to them, in some ways, is encouraging. It's instructive. It's also very corrective. 
Sometimes he rebukes them harshly for what they're doing. You should know better, right? But how else are they going to learn? He addresses the worldly situations that surround them and those things that have crept into the church. And he reminds them of this powerful gospel of the good news that is for everyone. And that is everyone who would accept him. Even these corrupt, hopeless people in Corinth. I think it reminds us of that same thing today. And Lebanon is certainly no hustling, bustling seaport city, right? But in the midst of Lebanon, we see a culture that participates in misguided worship that doesn't really know who Jesus is. We can fall prey to moral bankruptcy the same way the church at Corinth did. And so we need that instruction and we need encouragement. And sometimes we need correction too. That is what it means to be a part of God's people is that we learn and we grow and we become more and more like Christ along the way. And so as we read through 1 Corinthians, I think we'll see how to worship and how to live in a way that fulfills God's calling on our lives. That helps us to find his purpose for us, even when people around us don't understand. And hopefully that process molds us into a beacon of light and hope that goes out to the community around us and says, you don't have to be stuck in that. You can discover that Jesus brought good news for everyone. And so today, we're going to start in Paul's letter in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we're just going to read the introduction today. Because I want this day to set the stage for what we're going to learn in the weeks ahead. To have a chance to speak to our hearts and understand what God wants to do in us. So if you have your Bible and you want to turn, we'll be in 1 Corinthians 1. You can look it up in your app if you want. Or there's some Bibles over there on the shelf if you want to read along with us. And I'll be reading from the New Living Translation today. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and from our brother Sosthenes. I am writing to God's church in Corinth, to you who have been called by God to be his own holy people. He made you holy by means of Christ Jesus, just as he did for all people everywhere who will call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. I always thank my God for you and for the gracious gifts he has given you now that you belong to Christ Jesus. Through him, God has enriched your church in every way with all of your eloquent words and all of your knowledge. And this confirms that what I told you about Christ is true. Now you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. God will do this. For he is faithful to do what he says. And he has invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So this is kind of a traditional opening for a letter, that you would start the letter by saying who it's from and who it's to. It is a greeting from the the letter's author. And so did you notice here that Paul identifies himself as a called apostle, right? And truly it was Jesus who chose him. And if you remember the story of Paul, you know that Paul was no better than the Corinthians around him, right? That he was called out of a life of um, murdering Christians. And in the midst of that, God called him to speak on his behalf. And so by referencing that, Paul is telling them, I'm not writing by my own authority, but by the authority that was given to him by God. And this Sosthenes that he mentioned is a companion of his who likely came out of the church of Corinth. We believe that he was actually the leader of the synagogue in Corinth. So he would have been a Jewish leader who had now converted to Christianity. 
He also would have been known by the people who were receiving the letter, which helped Paul to write with more authority that, okay, this is somebody that Sosthenes knows, so he must be okay, right? But Paul actually had founded this church on his second missionary trip. And now he's on his third missionary trip, and he's writing to them from Ephesus. And so he himself would have known some of the members of the church, but hopefully some had come to the church since then too, right? He says he's writing to, he says, to you who have been called by God to be his own holy people. Other translations say to you who are sanctified. And to, say, to be sanctified or to be holy means to be set aside for God's purposes, right? And so what a powerful thought that in the middle of Corinth, in the middle of this busy, hell-bent town, you have these people whom God has called to be his, to be set apart from that worldly place and instead belong to him. That's who Paul is writing to. They are called out and set apart for God. And his wish is that they would know the grace and the peace of God. And notice that grace always comes before peace, right? Because grace is that undeserved favor that we get from God, that thing that allows us to become his children even though we don't deserve it. And once we fall under his grace and become his, that's when we experience true peace, right? And we can spend our whole lives searching for peace in the world around us and never find it if we don't understand the grace of God that has allowed us to be his. And so Paul's prayer for them is that they would experience God's grace and peace. And then the rest of his text is pretty much a thanksgiving for this church. And he points out what the church has received as a part of God's family, right? So not only have they received God's grace, but also he says that you have eloquent words, right? So these are people who were probably intellectually um, strong. They knew how to speak. They had great knowledge, he said. And then he says you also have these gifts, these spiritual gifts that are empowered by God and the Holy Spirit in order to carry out God's work. And if you trace the meaning of the word gift back, it, goes, it actually means the manifestation of God's grace. And so you see what God gives to them, these gifts that enable them to be the church, is actually proof that God's grace is working in them. The Holy Spirit in them makes them different and gives them something they didn't have before. And here's what I love about this passage because it must have been so difficult for them to remain set apart and to break free from the life they knew before and to become this holy people. But what Paul is telling them is you already have every gift, everything you need in order to be who God has called you to be. Everything they need is right there with this group of Christians. And that doesn't mean that those gifts they've been given won't be misused. And in fact, that's part of the problem in Corinth, right? Is, is not that they don't have gifts. It's that when they have gifts, sometimes they use them in the wrong way, right? But Paul's reassurance to them at the outset of this letter is, but you make sure you know, you have everything you need to be God's holy people. He has already given it to you. So they don't have to worry about giving up. They don't have to worry about whether they'll persevere until Jesus comes back again. God already knows what they need to persevere, and he's already given it to them. You see, when they became partners with God, they were given access to his power through his Holy Spirit. And that power and that strength meant that they could live under that grace and under that peace no matter what was going on in the world around them. I think that's reassuring. Do you? It's so easy for us humans to look around the world and think, I can't do this. It's so easy to look at ourselves and feel like we are lacking something. And I'm sure that this church faced persecution 
an immense pressure to give up, to go back to their old ways. Do you think? I can remember that when I first became a Christian. I can remember a family member who said, why did you go and join a cult? I can remember friends who liked to do things that I didn't do anymore. And how persistent they were sometimes at trying to convince me that it would be okay. I'm sure the church in Corinth faced a lot of pressure to bend their knees to the false gods around them. That maybe those idols they grew up with, those monuments they walked by that they used to stop and pray to, maybe they could even feel them calling to them as they walked by today in the modern day to remember who you used to worship. It must have been hard to be the church in Corinth. Do you remember what it's like for old friends to entice you? Oh, come on and have a drink with us. We'll have a good time. Oh, here, have a cigarette. Just one. There's no such thing as just one cigarette, by the way. Right? People around you, even the ones who supposedly care about you, don't want you to succeed at another way of life if it leaves them behind. In part because if you succeed, then it reminds them that they could probably succeed too, but they're not. The enemy doesn't want you to live a godly life, does he? The enemy does not want you to be holy and set apart for God. You do understand that, right? And the enemy is not just people, right? There is this spiritual warfare that goes on every day for our souls. There is this powerful enemy that prowls about looking for ways to trip you up so that you'll go back to the old way of life. Do you know that? And so I imagine that Corinth was surrounded by that enemy, right? All of these things to false gods. Satan must have had a heyday in that town. And so surely he was going to the church and saying, I'm going to plant this seed of division, or I'm going to plant this seed of immorality, or I'm going to convince them to compromise what Jesus has showed them. But Paul says, you have everything you need. And so we don't have to be discouraged. We don't have to worry about whether or not we have what it takes to be a God-honoring Christian. We don't. That doesn't mean it'll be easy, but you have everything you need to live a life that honors God. Every single thing. Maybe others think they can do it because they know more or because they've done more or they've been raised in a different environment or culture than you, but, but Corinth didn't have that excuse, did they? They didn't grow up knowing what it meant to belong to God or to be a part of his people. And yet God called them out of that and said, I want you to be my example for the world. Sometimes we get so caught up in a mindset of this is how I've always done things or I don't know a different way or, or my life's always been about me or nobody else ever cared about me so I had to take care of myself or all of these things that we get in our minds that keep us right here instead of laying it all down and experiencing the grace and the peace of God that allows us to step into the fullness of who he's called us to be. And what a glorious day it is when we can lay all that down and say, you know what, God, I know. I know, I have everything I need. I'm not too old, I'm not too young, I'm not too smart, I'm not too dumb. I'm not too quirky. I'm not too introverted. I'm not too addicted. None of that, you know why? Because I have everything I need. And you know where it comes from? It comes from Jesus Christ. Now if you go back and you read those nine verses again, do you know what's cool about those nine verses? Every single one of them uses the name of God or the name of Jesus. Because when it comes to us having everything we need, that's all, it, that's all it is. It's God and Jesus in us, wanting to do a work in us as individuals and as a church, right? And we are a small church, right? Other churches around us collect in one Sunday what we do all year long. You know what? It doesn't matter. We have everything we need 
right here to be a beacon of light in this community to say that it doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, where you came from. It doesn't matter who you worshiped before or who your parents were. What matters is that Jesus loves you. That his grace and his peace are there for you. And if you will let down everything else, you can step into that for yourself. That's what we're called to be, isn't it? That's who we're called to be. A beacon of light. Like the lighthouse on the shore of Charleston. Saying, you may be lost at sea, but here we are. Here it is. Come on. We'll get you home safely. Maybe that seems kind of scary or radical for you. Maybe it seems hard. But I think it's worth it. Don't you? When we read through the rest of this book, there are going to be times when we feel convicted or maybe offended by some of the scriptures in in Paul's letters. But I hope that we can go back to this passage and this message throughout our time in this series to say, it's okay if it hurts. It's okay if I'm not completely convinced. It's okay if changing will be hard. Because I have everything I need. Let me read those last couple of verses to you again. It says, He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. Isn't that your goal? To finish the race, right? God will do this for he is faithful to do what he says. And he has invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ, the Lord. And so that is your invitation today. You are invited into partnership with Jesus. No longer a slave to sin. No longer defined by whatever labels the world would put on you. But partners with Jesus. And together we have everything we need. We're going to go back into a time of worship. And uh, we're going to invite the band to come on back up. And my challenge to you is to search yourself. Are you a partner with Jesus today? And if you're not, maybe that's something that we need to pray about together. We have altars on either side of our sanctuary where you can go and pray. And there's nothing magical about those altars. It's just a great place to bend your knee and humble yourself before the Lord. And if you come to this altar over here, someone will come and pray with you. Or if you'd like to pray by yourself, you can come to this altar over here. And we'll let you you have space and time to do that. Or maybe your response today is just to stand and worship with him and thank him for allowing you to be his partner. But let's celebrate this God who gave us everything we need today. Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for your grace that calls every single one of us into your family. And we thank you for the peace that comes after that, knowing that we have what it takes to persevere, to finish the race, to see you come again, Jesus. Oh, God, forgive us for the times when we get so caught up in the world and the things that are going on around us that we forget to live for you. Forgive us for the times when we become so self-centered that we seek our pleasure instead of yours. Forgive us for the times that we feel inadequate to be your partners and instead help us to trust what you've already put in us. Children and to be your church. May we step boldly and proudly into your kingdom and declare the name of Jesus to anyone who would listen. We give ourselves to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand if you can as we worship? I can 
consider what you have made the mighty oceans the fiery stars the fields and forests give you praise my lord my god Take it all, 
take it all my life in your hands I lay down my life I take up my cross think about that this week and you feel like you need to talk a little bit more about what it looks like to surrender to Jesus. I hope that you'll call me. We can have coffee and talk about it, right? I'll have sweet tea. You can have coffee and we'll talk about it. <laughs> All right, just a few announcements for you before we go this morning. Um, this Friday is our family movie night and so it starts at 7.30. We're going to be watching A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. And so I'd love for you to come and join us for that. Um, it's a Tom Hanks movie and um, a lot of fun. Mostly it's just about having time together, hang out, and be God's church. And we'll have snacks and popcorn. We're bringing back the popcorn machine. So 7.30, not 7, which is our usual time at 7.30. Um, and so I hope that you'll join us and bring a friend or two if you want. All right. Also, remind, just a reminder that we're still stocking the pantry at um, Compassionate Hands. So if you can bring individually sized um, oatmeals or pastries or juice, that would be great. You can leave that on the counter out there. We've been running like 28 guys a night at the shelter. And so it takes a lot of food to feed that many people in the mornings. And so what we do is we fill the pantry so that if someone hasn't brought breakfast that morning, they have something to eat. So um, you can also put some cash in there or some laundry detergent in there if you want, um, whatever we can do. But, um, and while we're on that subject, I do have to publicly thank Tim and Greg for filling in for all of us this week. So yeah. <laughs> So Tim and or Greg were there every night at the shelter this week because some of us were in Charleston and others were snowed in at home. So um, yeah, guys, thank you. And what a blessing you are to our church. And now other people get to see it too. So, all right. It's Girl Scout cookie time, right? We were not here in the last time that we um, met to place our final orders. So if you still want cookies, you can probably write it on the sheet that's out there. And hopefully the, the cookies will be here next week. You have to put your money in there. If you ordered s'mores, which I think two of you did, they're sold out of those. So you can either take your money back out or switch to another cookie if you want to do that. Um, just let us know. So anyway, 
I know, right? It's just crazy times. It's been a good day, hasn't it? Yes, if you have a tithe or offering to bring to the Lord today, we encourage you to put it in a bucket as you leave. Um, or many of you do that online, and so we so appreciate that as well. Pastor Elizabeth Ann, would you like to come and close us in prayer this morning? Pray for everybody to get home safe, right? Yeah. Will you join me in prayer? God, first, we are just thankful to be here today for those of us that could join in person and get here safely God, what a blessing that is to just come back together and um, worship you and, and learn from your word. God, thank you for the message today and for the messages to come on 1 Corinthians. And we just pray, God, that um, if we responded or felt a calling on our lives based on this message this morning, that we would let someone know. God, we just pray that all of us would live our lives for you that we would be um, beacons of light shining for you in the darkness. I pray safety over all of us as we head home and head out into our weeks. Thank you for all these things in your son's name. Amen. Have a good week.